Last week, we told you about how George Hotz from Comma AI had discontinued his Comma One. He decided not to release it. That's a device that turns a regular car into a self-driving car because he just didn't want to do it because he was frustrated with all the regulation. <laughs> self-driving cars are hard. We asked car tech expert Sam Abul Al Samid to tell us more about what happened with George Hotz and what it says about the future of self-driving cars. Welcome, Sam. Hey, Megan and Jason. Great to be back. <laughs> it's good to have you. So first, tell us what the Comma One uh, was supposed to be, What a little bit behind the technology. Yeah, so we first heard about uh, George Hotz's latest project back, I think it was last December. Uh, the Verge reported on it, uh, that he was developing his own uh, self-driving car technology, um, doing it on his own personal car and Acura ILX. And uh, then a few months later, we heard that he got a $3 million venture investment or seed investment um, to, and he was planning to actually produce this system for sale as an aftermarket semi-autonomous system that would be uh, comparable to what Tesla was offering with their first generation autopilot system. So it would be able to follow the lanes and, and follow the cars in front of you, um, doing the, you know, automatically slowing down and speeding up to maintain a safe distance. Um, and in September at the TechCrunch Disrupt conference, uh, he, George uh, took the stage to uh, present the device that they were planning to launch by the end of this year called the Comma One, which is supposed to sell for $999 and added, included a camera and the processing unit and tied into um, the, the vehicle network to use the radar sensor that was already installed for adaptive cruise control. Uh, and first, it was initially going to be available for um, the Honda Civic um, and uh, and also some other Honda vehicles, I guess, uh, and then eventually be available for other brands of vehicles. And so when you first heard what Hotz was doing and you saw um, his presentation at Disrupt, at TechCrunch Disrupt, what, what were your initial impressions of him? You've been in this space for a long time. You've been an engineer. Uh, what did you think of what he was doing? Uh, well, you know, I've, I've kind of followed uh, Hotz's exploits for a number of years. Uh, first heard about him back in 2007 when he was part of the group that jailbroke the original first generation iPhone. And then uh, a couple of years after that, he unlocked the Sony PlayStation 3. Uh, he's had uh, he's worked at a, a few different companies in the Valley. I think he uh, had a stint at Google and at Facebook, uh, both relatively short stints. And when I heard he was doing this, um, yeah, as as somebody, you know, I'm sure he's he's a very smart guy. I've unfortunately I've never had the opportunity to actually speak to him because he uh, has declined to respond to any of my inquiries over the last six months. I've tried to reach out to him and he has never responded, nor has anyone else from Comma.ai. Um, I wanted to learn more about what they were doing, and basically, you know, the attitude that he seems to have, you know, from listening to him talk in other interviews and from the the um, the TechCrunch uh, disrupt presentation. Um, he comes across as kind of arrogant, like he knows better than what everybody else does, and and how to do this stuff, how to do this self driving stuff. Um, and frankly, this is not a guy whose product I would trust in my car or my family or anybody around me on the road. Um, I'm sure that he's he's very smart, but I'm sure that he's also taking a lot of shortcuts to do what he's doing. Uh, so. You know, I'm, I'm, I was frankly glad when I heard that uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration had reached out to get more information. They didn't threaten them or anything. You know, they just said, look, you know, we heard what you're doing and we, we want to know a bit more about it. What are you doing to validate that this thing is safe, um, you know, to protect the rest of the vehicles on the road um, as well as people that buy this? And um, apparently as soon as he got that letter, he decided, you know what, uh, this isn't worth the hassle and canceled the product. So was there anything behind that? I mean, when we reported this story, it's like, really, he just got this letter. They just wanted to look uh, more into it. And then he says, ah, it's too much. I'll sell it in China. Was there, no one is sends it, me a letter. <laughs> where, was there more to it? Is there something we're missing? Um, you know, I think it was just a matter of, um, I mean, my guess is, you know, and this, this is speculation because, you know, nobody's really talking from uh, Comma.ai. Uh, but my guess is that the, Probably the lawyers for his his investors, um, you know, maybe said, you know, before we put this thing on sale, uh, maybe we should take a little bit deeper look at this and make sure that we've actually crossed our eyes, or crossed our T's and dotted our eyes, and make sure this thing really is safe, um, because 
you know, without, you know, if you put some, if you sell something like this and it goes wrong, you're going to have some pretty hefty lawsuits potentially uh, to deal with. You know, I mean, my, I, you know, I, I found out that they had canceled this thing on Friday morning as I was actually walking into a conference um, in uh, San Francisco. I was in Fr San Francisco last week and I was chairing a conference on um, ADAS to self-driving vehicles. That's driver assist systems and, and self-driving vehicles. Um, and originally, uh, George was actually scheduled to be the keynote uh, speaker on Friday morning. And then a few days before the conference, they swapped, they switched him out for somebody else uh, from comma.ai. And then as I was walking in uh, to the conference uh, uh, venue, uh, I was looking at my phone and saw on, on my nuzzle feed the Ver Verge story that uh, comma.ai just announced that they had canceled the project. And, uh, <laughs> and then when I got inside, um, I, I heard that, uh, yeah, they, they wouldn't be speaking. And so, uh, you know, I got up and spoke and part of my presentation, I, I talked about, um, you know, what we had discussed the day before when we were talking about regulations around autonomous driving. Uh, one of the things in the, um, the, the federal government guidance that came out about a month or so ago was they talked about, uh, defining what are the operational domains of these systems, you know, so where, where do they work? Where don't they work? And making sure that, anybody producing these kinds of products, producing self-driving vehicles or any other related products, needs to make sure that the customers understand those operational domains. What, you know, what, what can this thing do? What can it not do? Um, and I think that's something that you know, they probably decided it was just, you know, it was not gonna work. You know, one of the stories that I told um, was about you know, during my days as an engineer uh, back in the early 90s, uh, developing a traction control system and from looking at the data as we were doing the development i realized you know you could probably detect um some more things you know using just the wheel speed sensors which is all we had in those days we didn't have lidar or radar or accelerometers in the car and using the wheel speed sensors i could i found a pattern between the way the the wheel speeds were behaving and whether the car was um skidding or 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 sliding uh nose first off of a curve and put together what was essentially a crude stability control system. And it worked pretty well on the snow and ice in northern Sweden. Uh, but then when we got back to Michigan at the end of the winter, we started testing it on different surfaces and found that it wasn't, it wasn't um, reliable enough to use for, you know, in the real world. You know, so, you know, we recognized the limitations of what the system was. And, we, you know, there was still a piece of that that we ended up using for just for curve detection, you know, de uh, determining when the car was going around a curve and using that in the ABS and traction control. But it wasn't until several years later when we had mo more sophisticated sensors that we were able to do stability control. And I think, you know, this is the sort of thing that, that Hotz and his team and, and everybody else, you know, that's working on this autonomous driving stuff needs to recognize is that, you know, recognize what the limitations are and don't put out products that, um, that, either imply or would lead customers to think that they can do more than they're really capable of. You make a really good point in your article about kind of the differences between, let's say, the the kind of legacy long-term auto industry and how they approach, you know, safety and, and these sorts of things versus kind of the technology in industry. And, you know, a lot of technology products don't have, like, like if an app crashes, like it's just an app crashing. It's not a vehicle crashing. So the, right. the kind of there's, the there's risk no, involved no, is no way lower. Impact for that. No, no long term impact for that. I mean, is that just a? I mean, th this seems like a a huge lesson for those in the technology space to learn, right? That that you know your your methods of of taking your technology company and 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 building it to something great might work in one way, but they might not work in this other way nearly as as well. Like in the case of comma uh, the comma one, I mean. Like in my in my head, the idea of like, well, we'll give you this little kit, and all you got to do is put this on the top of your car, and you know maybe have this thing, and 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 all the you know all the cameras, the three cameras or however many you know cameras are on this thing are gonna be able to crunch and and figure out everything and and keep you safe. But you know one thing that you point out is just like the challenge of wide variety of driving conditions. So it goes beyond just being able to recognize that there's something in front of you and stop before you hit it. It goes into all of the wild calculations that come into, well, this is driving on concrete. This is driving on, you know, black ice. Like how do, I mean, is it too much to ask, too much to think that a normal technology company like Comma could release something for $1,000 that could do all of that? 
Uh, I, I think that they could do it in time. I think that, you know, what they had at this point was being rushed to market. You know, he, he came to the, the conclusion, you know, when he started working on this, he, he got something that worked under, you know, limited conditions, you know, in the, the area where he was testing around, around Palo Alto, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley. And, you know, the conditions are fairly consistent there. You know, it doesn't rain much. It pretty much yeah. doesn't snow. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much always the same. And so, you know, it, it would be fairly straightforward to develop a system that could work reasonably well under those conditions. But, you know, the thing that you find from car makers and the suppliers that make the sensors and all, all the other stuff, they don't test in just one location. They test all over the world, you know, and they rack up millions of miles under all kinds of different conditions. You know, you test in, you know, 40 below temperatures, you know, near the Arctic and test in, in desert conditions and mountains and everywhere in between. And, you know, I think what, you know, what we're seeing here is that, you know, some of the, some of these startups are starting to realize that, Hey, you know, we need to do a little more work on this, you know, before we put this to market, or at least I hope they're, they're realizing that, that they need to do a little more work to, to make sure that this is really robust before they start selling it to consumers that, that don't have the technical wherewithal to really understand what they're buying. Right. So you described HOTS as arrogant and cutting corners. Some have said the same thing about Elon Musk uh, and the way he's gone about uh, with Tesla and autopilot. How, how would you describe ways in which they're different and maybe similar? Um, I think that, you know, in some respects, there are a lot of similarities. I, you know, I think that um, Tesla has perhaps pushed out um, their technology, you know, the autopilot stuff a little bit too quickly. And, you know, for, for what it's capable of doing so far, it's actually really good at it. And I, you know, I don't quibble with that, but I think that the way a lot of people have talked about it, they, you get the implication that if you don't, if you're not really paying attention, that it's capable of doing a lot more than it really is right now. And I think, you know, it, it's certainly, it's, it's been getting better. And it will continue to get better. And, you know, the, the second generation stuff that they just announced a couple of weeks ago with more cameras and, and more sensors um, will certainly, you know, eventually be much better than, than what's available today. But it's not, um, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, I asked the, the people in attendance at the conference on Friday was, you know, it was about 100 people in the room. And I said, you know, how many of you actually think that, you know, the, the system that Tesla has just described with eight cameras around the car um, and one radar sensor and some ultrasonic sensors is going to be adequate for a truly um, what, you know, what we call a level five uh, autonomous car, which means that it can operate without human intervention under all conditions anywhere. And not a single person raised their hand. Nobody actually believes that that can that, that can be a fully autonomous under all conditions system. Um, just because of the limitations of, of the camera sensors and the radar sensor, um, there will always be conditions where they can't work properly. Uh, and, you know, it'll, it'll be far more capable than anything that's out there today. But, you know, there will also be others, there are other systems that are in development that have more sensors. So you have more, more overlap and more redundancy that'll cover more conditions than you can possibly do with just the cameras and the radar. So while you were at these conferences, uh, what's the general consensus about the NHTSA regulations that George Hotz had issues with? And, and what do you think about them? Are they, um, are they practical? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, at this point, NHTSA hasn't actually um, issued any, you know, hard regulations. What they issued was guidance, you know, saying, here's some guidelines for what we want you to do as you're developing these systems. So there's nothing that's actually um, in law, you know, that in terms of, you know, having to certify these systems for any particular performance capabilities, what they, you know, what they're saying is you've got to be able to, you know, we want you to record data, um, you know, and when things happen, you, you know, we want you to be able to go back and look at the data and understand what's happening. You also need to develop processes for how you're going to educate consumers, um, how you're going to validate this, uh, this technology. Um, so, you know, I think what they did was, you know, some, some pretty common sense, uh, a pretty common sense framework for development of these systems. And, you know, besides that, you know, they're taking a largely hands-off approach. They're letting the technology develop, you know, and I think it's, it's probably a little early, you know, I think, and everybody, most of the people I've talked to agree that it's, it's too early to have any 
um, uh, you know, what, what we call federal motor vehicle safety standards. So like actual regulations um, about how these systems can perform uh, or should perform before they're sold to consumers. Uh, and so I think I think that NHTSA is on the right track with this stuff. Well, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Sam Abul El Samid is a senior editor, senior analyst with Navigant Research, covering alternative fuels, advanced driving technologies, and connected vehicles. Thank you again for coming to talk to us, Sam. A pleasure as always. <laughs> thank you, Sam. Take care.